Welcome back, everybody. Today is another episode of the Hero Counters course, and we're going to continue going in alphabetical order. So next up is our boy, Anti-Mage. So let's go ahead and get right into it. Banana Slam Jam. We pull up his Dota buff page and we look at the heroes he's best against and heroes that he's worst against. So one thing we want to add that I already talked about last week, but it's going to be added moving forward is what is the hero's signature spell? What spell defines this hero the most? And for Anti-Mage, I would say it's probably his blink. And then you kind of add Battle Fury in there. He's basically a mobile split pushing farmer. All of his other spells help him in fights and they definitely matter, but his most defining spell to his play style is the fact that he's consistently blinking around the map and generally not the best in team fights until he gets a lot of items. Honestly, it's not as much roll as it is just raw physical damage, but it is mainly cores. He's countered mainly by offlaners and carries, those of which who offer a lot of physical damage, the legions, the slardars in the offlane, and the carries like Troll Warlord and PA. So Anti-Mage, he always likes to play alone, but unlike a hero like Spectre, he's not really able to go to fights whenever he wants to. And most of the time, you can gear up for his entire team to have to play around his playstyle because he's a carry that never really does change his playstyle. So building items that are basically assuming the opponent is never just going to five-man down a lane uh, tend to go up in value, such as items like Silver Edge for picking him off. Um, or just general catch mobility items to keep up with the anti-mage combined with damage items to bring him down in a stun duration. So anti-mage, he is a backline jumper. Uh, he never really wants to be the first guy to go in unless he maybe has an Aegis. He likes to pick and choose his targets. You gotta be careful um, when it comes to blinking in uh, to a precarious position because most of the time anti-mage when he dies It's because he blinks in the opponent recognizes his blinks on cooldown for a few seconds and they immediately Focus him down and he really especially looks for those juicy high mana targets and Oftentimes does not present himself until either the fights already broken out or he's even connecting from across the map Where he didn't even he wasn't even at the fight to begin with so Anti-Mage is almost certainly a hero you have to kill. Even if Anti-Mage can't really kill you, uh, he will burn your mana. Surviving for a long time against Anti-Mage generally is not a reliable strategy. Uh, surviving against Anti-Mage is much less powerful than it is to actually kill him. So itemizing to kill him is generally much more important. Really important to note that for the first 15 to 20 minutes, Anti-Mage is a non-factor in the game. You can gank him if you want to. It's absolutely important to do so if possible, but if you're lacking disables and his mobility is a problem, you can acknowledge that he's not farming very fast prior to his Battle Fury. And a lot of times you can pick on his team as opposed to picking on the Anti-Mage because they have a carry that's effectively not taking towers, not flash farming, not participating in fights. They are effectively playing 4v5. So a lot of times, especially as a carry player, when I'm against Anti-Mage, I like to take a little bit more part in the mid-game team fights, and I think especially carries that can do that are even better against Anti-Mage uh, for that exact reason. He scales in the game based on his magic resistance and continual use of Blink. So the biggest thing about Anti-Mage is he's countered by Silver Edge as an item. He's countered by Diffusal Blade as an item because there's two ways to deal with Anti-Mage. It's either you don't have the damage to deal with his magic passive and you go Silver Edge and you just kill him. The other option is that you burn his mana so that he can not blink. Anti-Mage does not like low cooldown continuous disables, and he also doesn't like non-targeted disables, or at least instant targeted disables. But being able to lock him down full to zero is something that you'll generally need a lot of items on most heroes in order to do. And building to that point where you think your lineup can do that is absolutely essential against Anti-Mage because once he's able to die full to zero, um, the hero becomes almost unplayable in fights. The biggest thing about Anti-Mage is that you want some counter initiator that makes him hesitate to blink on targets. Heroes like Axe and Legion and Slardar, if Anti-Mage blinks on anyone else, they're going to blink on the Anti-Mage and effectively kill him. So heroes like this are the best at preventing Anti-Mage from killing. So strong physical damage auras like a Soul Curass, Vlad's, Drums, stuff that just buffs up your team's right-click damage as a whole and inevitably making it so he can no longer blink into fights 
is when Anti-Mage feels very underwhelming. The next up, we got Arc Warden. So Arc Warden's most signature spell. I would say it's his clone. Gives him two of every single item, uh, and it allows him to split push the map and also participates in fights from across the map. But also most notably is his uh, magnetic field, because that's his main way of living. We're going to see a lot of summons illusion heroes because uh, Spark Wraith as well as Flux do absolutely nothing to multiple units. Um, all of his best matchups, as you can see, are long-range damage guys that have no reliable gap close. Pretty straightforward there. So when we look at his worst matchups, I think it's pretty clear that offlaners and carries are, his, are the heroes that counter him. Most notably, all summons and illusions make this hero really difficult to play. This hero plays the map incredibly defensively. You know, for the first 30 minutes of the game, Arc Warden could easily find himself never crossing the river to the opponent's side of the map. It is really important to note that in a bad game of Arc Warden, you're gonna get stuck in your base. And the only thing that can leave on the entire team is Arc Warden's clone. In a good Arc Warden game, the hero can be on his own side of the map farming his side of the map while his clone is on the opponent's side of the map also farming theirs. So he's effectively getting twice as much farm, but he's, he feels safe to farm with his real hero. Uh, he is ultra patient, similar to Anti-Mage, waiting for Anti-Mage's time to blink in. But Arc Warden, on the other hand, is very rarely ever wanting to use his real hero. Because of the way people build him nowadays, his real hero never even wants to go in. They purely rely on the cooldown reduction and the split pushing of their clone to get favorable map positioning, such that their real hero never has to be at risk. So the two options are to be able to hunt the real hero down or be able to do enough damage to the clone that... Arc Warden's team fight contribution is simply unimpactful. Arc Warden, because of his kiting kit, uh, with all of his slows and his ability to dish out tons of different or like duplicates of items throughout the course of fights, and ability to split push, you have to bring the fight to him. Inevitably, you either have to force him to defend his towers with his real hero, such that you can kill it, or you can actually just straight up kill his real hero. So any gap closers. Any heroes that get up in his face, these are how you deal with them. You do not out-survive Arc Warden, right? He does not allow you to win long fights. He will eventually bring you down. So a lot of these ranged heroes that rely on sniping you over time or damage over time are generally very weak against Arc Warden. Remember, short, sweet burst against Arc Warden up in his face is how you deal with them. And not only is it these summons heroes and illusion heroes, that counter him because of his natural skill set, but it's also because if we jump to the pace of the game, power spikes of the hero, these heroes tend to either have weak early games as illusion heroes, and Arc Warden applies literally no pressure, or he also wants nothing to happen for the first 20 minutes, so the last thing he wants is the opponent barreling down lanes and killing a bunch of buildings. His hero clone can just be anywhere on the map, and he can do that without having to worry about jeopardizing his real hero. So in the late game, he scales with this clone, and if you let him get to like five, six items, abusing the double Midas over the course of the game, this is why people tend to think of Arc Warden as a complete and utter nightmare. The biggest thing about this hero is that one of his best ways of scaling is his ability to turtle in base. If you are against Arc Warden and you're forcing him to sit in his base and the rest of his team is forced to sit in their base, you should never feel rushed to end the game and go high ground. If Arc Warden is the only hero on his entire team getting farm, it will not be enough to beat you. So most importantly, when it comes to scaling against this hero, do not feel rushed. Do not feel a sense of urgency to do anything more than lock him in his base. And if you are having struggles ending the game because of the bubble on towers and all that stuff, you should definitely focus on patience and corralling the enemy heroes that try to leave their base. Hunting the people that try to escape, because that's the only way they're going to get a meaningful amount of farm, beat you. A lot of people tend to look at a hero like Arc Warden. They know he scales really well into the late game with items, and they think we need to end the game early. But Arc Warden's entire kit is only strong at preventing you from doing that. But he's not strong at preventing you from making him sit in his base. And that's what you should try to do when you're looking to scale against him. So natural counters is that you have summons and illusions that allow your units to tank spells like Spark Wraith and not care about spells like Flux. He kills you by kiting you with slows and single target spells. And the only AoE he gets ever is Gleipnir and Strength Link. So yes, 
that AoE can be a bit annoying for a lot of heroes, but it's not enough to kill illusions. It's not enough to kill an entire army of summons. Also, if you have heroes that don't rely on blink for mobility, it's a nice added bonus because a lot of times you'll try to get on top of the Arc Warden and he'll be able to cancel blinks because of all of his spark wraiths on the ground because of his clone. Super useful for survivability against Arc Warden but also for catching the Arc Warden. Next up, we have Axe. So starting off with his signature spell, for me, Axe's signature spell is his Call. It is a low cooldown, AoE, EKB piercing, disable, that taunts you. And Axe's entire itemization centers around this ability. He usually goes for Blink Blade Mail, and then any other items that allow him to Blink Blade Mail on top of you. So when we look at his matchups, high physical damage heroes, single target, and illusion heroes because of the Blink Call, um, on all the units. Um, and then on the other hand, he's worse versus heroes that do virtually no physical damage, that have consistent slows, and are almost purely magical damage. Uh, Axe is an anti-carry hero, so sadly it's hard to pick carries that are good against Axe. Um, yes, you see Spectre, but other than her, none of these top 10 heroes are carries. So you have to think about that Axe is predominantly countered by opponent utility offlaners, as well as mid laners that are all magic DOT based heroes. Axe for the first 15 minutes of the game, he likes to be playing his own lane, cutting creeps with a vanguard, farming up his blink. Uh, that's what he likes to do. It's really important as Axe that he gets that early start. So shutting that down with like early rotations from the four position or the mid laner can be absolutely crucial to ruining Axe's game. He's usually vulnerable to heroes killing him when he's cutting creep waves, but it takes three or four heroes because he's super beefy early on. Axe can either be like the first guy to go in initiating, that usually comes out of a smoke. He relies on catching you off guard because blade mail no longer goes through BKB. So Axe needs to make sure he jumps you before you see him. If you're not smoked as Axe, he will generally want to wait for somebody to go in on the opponent team and then he will counter initiate. So if you're one of these high physical damage burst heroes that dies to Axe Blade Mail, it's super important that you outweight him. That if you usually would be a hero like PA that would blink on a target and kill them, to know that if Axe has not shown himself in the fight yet, you simply cannot go in. So Axe relies on short fights and it is all about making sure he does not kill you. If Axe does not kill you in a call, this hero kind of just blows. So having long drawn out kiting spells, kiting items, items that break up his call is all that matters. This hero is a farmer for 15 minutes until he gets a blink. And then he's a god for the next 5 or 10 minutes. And if he doesn't get kills in the next 5 or 10 minutes, he generally doesn't get any more items. So it's really important that we slow him down for the first 15 minutes, dodge his power spike from like the next 5 to 10 minutes where he's going to be consistently hunting with Blink Blade Mail, not just feeding off cooldown and giving him that permanent armor from his ult. And then later on, once we have the items on the carry to survive the call in one or two saves, this hero's power level goes way down. Uh, this hero scales with physical damage resistance from Call and his ultimate armor, and he never really gets a way to deal with kiting. This hero can just never deal with kiting damage over time spells. Natural counters are just saves. Heroes like OD, Astral, SD, uh, Disruption, uh, that is how you naturally counter this hero. And if you don't have the abilities themselves, heroes that naturally buy Yule Scepters and Four Staves will go a long way against Axe if you're wondering what to pick. And then also carries that have passives that benefit from being forced to hit you. Like Ursa, Monkey King, and Lifestealer are three of his worst carry matchups because they are carries that don't generally mind being taunted. They have some form of natural sustain or damage resistance so that the blade mill is not a guaranteed kill. So that's it for now, guys. Today's video, another three heroes in the books. Thanks for watching. Hope you liked it. Like, comment, subscribe. We'll be back next week with another three to add to the archives. See ya.